Please be seated. Well, we continue this morning our One Another series. And I don't know about you, but I find it to be a great blessing and benefit, but particularly a great challenge to my own life and to my own soul and my walk with the Lord Jesus Christ. If you missed any of the messages so far, please access them through our website and through our YouTube channel and and listen and uh, be blessed as you listen to them. We continue in this uh, theme uh, this morning of serving one another and of how to be servants. And this morning, I've entitled the message, Putting Others First. When Paul and other men who wrote the New Testament letters began their letters, they would often begin in using a term that we might feel or even be somewhat cautious of even daring to use today. Paul, Timothy, James, Peter, and Jude all described themselves in one place or another as bond servants or bond slaves of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the word that they are translating there is a word that means to be in total servitude to someone else. So when Paul began, for example, Romans chapter 1 and verse 1, he speaks of himself being a a slave or a bondservant or as a servant of the true and the living Lord Jesus Christ. And when he is saying that, he is saying to everyone around him that he is absolutely, 100% absolutely devoted to Jesus Christ. That's quite a thing to say, isn't it? But these men wrote those words not just because they felt it was fanciful to use such terms. In the first century world, perhaps even a third of Roman citizens were slaves at some level or another. So the the, the term was familiar in the first century world, perhaps much more to us in a Western world and certainly in the United Kingdom context. But nevertheless, Paul and others were able to say, I'm a a servant of Jesus, I'm a slave of Jesus, I'm a bondservant of the Lord Jesus. I am absolutely devoted to Jesus Christ. 100% of my, my every being, every part is devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we are to put others first in our life, if we are to serve others in our life, then we are going to first and foremost need to be absolutely 100% devoted to the Lord Jesus Christ. In Mark 10, 45, we read these words concerning Jesus Christ. For even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. And then to add to that, it says to give his life as a ransom for many. And Jesus, our Saviour this morning, Jesus, God's precious Son, the one that we need to be followers of here today, is the one who would desire of us to live in a way that he lived on earth, not to be served, but to serve, and to give our lives for others, to put others first. And as we've gone through these studies and sermons and messages in the one and others, we've been challenged week after week after week about the reality of one anothering each other, of serving one another, of putting others first. More than ourselves, but ultimately to put Jesus Christ first. In our reading this morning that Victor brought to us a few moments ago in Galatians 5, verse 13, page 1172, he says this, You, my brothers and sisters, were called to be free, but do not use your freedom to indulge that flesh, or the flesh. Rather, serve one another humbly in love. This is kind of the key verse this morning, Galatians 5.13. Do not use your freedom. We've been set free from our sins. In this sense, we're not slaves. We're we're set free. We're delivered from the, the bondage and hardship an entrapment of sin, and Jesus, because of his death for us on the cross, has set us free. We're forgiven men and women this morning. We serve a, a living Jesus Christ. He's alive today. His Holy Spirit empowers us and lives within us. 
And because we're free, do not lose that as a liberty to live as you please, but rather to serve one another, Paul says, humbly in love. If you and I this morning are going to put others first, there are three things that we need to do. Firstly, we need to intentionally plan to do so. Intentionally plan to do so. To intentionally plan to do something is to do something with purpose in our very heart, purpose in our very being, purpose in our very soul. The things that we really want to do, we will plan. We will put it into our diary. We will add it to our calendar. We will make record of it. We will intentionally decide to do that, whatever that might be. Things of important nature. It, this is something that we really need to do. To intentionally purpose to do something is really the beginning of being able to do it. Because if we don't intentionally put it down, if we don't intentionally plan to do it, we probably will fail. And we probably won't last doing that for very long. If you and I are going to put others first before God, we've got to say this morning, I plan, I purpose to do this. In Hebrews 10, 24, we read, let us consider how we might spur one another on towards love and good deeds. Another translation puts it like this, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and to good works. In other words, we need to consider it, we need to weigh it up, we need to think about what we're about and why we are Christ's people and how we should show his love in a fallen world. We need to consider and think of ways in which intentionally we will plan to serve and help others. And the best place that you will find to do this is in prayer. As you talk with God and as you listen to God, the place of prayer will be the place where God will reveal His heart to you, where His Holy Spirit in you will gently prompt you to make a phone call write an email, make a visit, pray for somebody in their world. When you are in this place of quietness, in this place of quiet time and devotion with God, meeting with God, you will discover the heart of God for your life and the heart of God in serving others and in putting others first in your life. If you do not intentionally do that, if you do not make the time in order to do that, you will rarely hear from the voice of God because you will be too busy. You will not want to stop and to listen and to reflect. Intentionally plan a place of prayer. The Holy Spirit guided Jesus day by day in his life and ministry on earth. For three and a half years, the Holy Spirit of God guided and directed the hand and the feet and, 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 and eyes of the Lord Jesus Christ. This morning in my Bible reading, and maybe some of you were there as well, in our daily bread, it was from, uh, sorry, a, a couple of days back, it was from John 4, I think it may have been yesterday. And in verse 4, we read some very significant words that are lost in our English, but the original language tells us what it's all about. In John 4, 4, it says, Now Jesus had to go through Samaria. Or some of the older translations said, Jesus must go through Samaria. And we can kind of read that and just miss the point completely. The point in the original language is this, Jesus had to go. He literally had to go. It wasn't like a physical having to go in order to get from A to B. It was a reason behind the fact that Jesus had to go to Samaria. Because, you know, Jesus sat down by a well in the middle of the day, and he was tired. I thank God that that verse is in the Bible this morning. I thank God that Jesus, the perfect Son of God, actually got tired. And he sat down. The Spirit of God clearly led him, although we're not told implicitly, but one day in history, Jesus sat down. And you know, I preached on John 4 probably 15, 20 times in my life. All different angles, the, the lady, the, the living water. 
The fact that when Jesus meets with the woman, she runs off to the nearest place and tells them everything that Jesus has said about her life. All angles I've looked at this story. And you know, I've always missed the fact that Jesus sat down first and then the woman came. She wasn't there to begin with. He sat down. If you and I sometimes do not get to the place of sitting down to listen to the Father, if you and I do not find a place where we can sit down to hear the voice of the Spirit of the living God, we will rarely hear His voice. Jesus sat down at a well, and then the woman came. The Spirit of God had led and prompted him to go to Samaria. Why? Because there was a woman that would come that day who would be a witness to him, and many through her life and testimony surely brought others to follow Jesus Christ. If you are going to put others first, you've got to intentionally plan to do so. Secondly, You've got to take some responsibility to do so. I spoke of the word of responsibility last Sunday evening in the sermons on letters of John. If you weren't able to be here, I'd encourage you to look at it. Now, I know there's a lady here who is far better to give advice on this subject than I, on the instruction that is given when you begin your flight in an aircraft. Not all of you may have had the privilege of flying. Uh, I've been blessed and been able to do that many times, and you do try to concentrate. It's important that you do you listen to the safety messages and all, all that sort of stuff. There comes the point in the video or the actual live display where the oxygen masks are taken out. And you kind of sit there and, and, and the man or the woman telling you the, what you need to listen to says, in, in an event of an emergency, oxygen masks will, will drop from overhead and Thanks very much. In an event of emergency, it doesn't sound too encouraging. You know, I don't really want to hear that just now. But nevertheless, this is what you hear. And if you're a responsible adult or something to this effect, you should put your mask on first. And I kind of think, well, that's a bit odd, isn't it? If we're called to serve others first. You know, I mean, that's a bit strange, that. You know, don't put it on little John or little Jane first. Put it on yourself and then put the mask on, on the person you're responsible for, the, the minor, perhaps, the weaker person, perhaps or the one who's unsure of what to do. Why is that? Well, it's possible, you see, that you could put the mask on your little child, and, and then you could be overcome, and then you're going to be of no use to assist them. Uh, they'll be all right, but they're unable probably to even help themselves. The reason for this is that you, being the stronger and responsible one, make sure that you're going to be conscious in order to help others around you. And there's a point in this to what I'm going to go on and say. If we're going to serve others, we need to take care of ourselves. Romans 15, verses 1 to 3 says this, We who are strong ought to bear with the failings of the weak and not please ourselves. Each of us should please our neighbors for their good to build them up, for even Christ did not please himself. We that are strong should bear with the failings of the weak and not to please ourselves. But I find myself this morning knowing that if we're to take responsibility, we've got to first and foremost be responsible for our own lives spiritually. If we're going to be of real benefit to others, we ourselves need to be in the right place. It's not that God cannot use us when we're not always in the right place because we are sinful people. We do let God down. We're not always going on as close with God as we really should do or really want to or really long to. And God, by His grace, still does use us. It's remarkable. It's, it's bizarre, really, but yet He does. But I just want to say to you this morning, if you and I are going to be of most use, if I could put it like this to others, we need to take our own responsibility very seriously for our walk with God. Because if we're not in a healthy place spiritually, how can we serve others? If we ourselves are not feeding from the hand of Almighty God, if we're not in sweet communion with the Father by the Son and through His Holy Spirit, then how can we be of great use and value to others? So first and foremost this morning... Intentionally plan to be a servant of Jesus. 
take responsibility of your own life and walk with God in order to be most effective. And thirdly, keep close to the Lord Jesus Christ, closely connected with taking responsibility. Jesus said in John 15, 5, I'm the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. This is a promise, hallelujah. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So this morning, if you're going to be effective as a man or a woman in this world, first and foremost, you must be connected to Jesus Christ. You must be a child of the living God. You must be in connection with Jesus. You must be in relationship with Him and have a relationship with Him through knowing the forgiveness of your sins through the shed blood of Christ for you on the cross. And as a child of God, you and I need to keep close to the Lord Jesus. And when we are close to the Lord Jesus, Jesus says we will bear much fruit. And by the way, we won't be able to bear anything apart from Jesus in our life. Apart from me, you can do nothing. We need to keep close to the Lord Jesus. Now, I have no idea who did the flowers today. I, I don't have I, I saw the rotor a couple of weeks ago, but I didn't memorize it. Please forgive me. But you will notice that we have an extra addition on the communion table this morning. And some of you spotted that head of the service and were quite concerned that it really spoilt the flower display. But there's a reason I brought my example to you today. Of a Lalandi, I presume that's what it is, or a dwarf Lalandi of some kind. It doesn't really look up so much, do you think? It's kind of practically dead, isn't it? It's been out there under the canopy for about, I don't know, six months or so. Chris has been trying to keep it alive, and it just hasn't worked. He's been trying. I've just ignored it, so at least he's been trying. Give him some credit. You see, we need to keep close to the Lord Jesus, because if we don't keep close to Jesus, we're going to end up looking a bit like that in our spiritual lives. A bit dry, a bit parched almost looking like we're, we're dead. And, and the psalmist has a lot to say about this. The first psalm itself, verse 3 says, of the righteous that want to live for God, they're like trees that are planted along the riverbank. They bear fruit each season. Their leaves, okay, it hasn't got leaves, but you know what I mean. Their leaves never wither, and they will prosper in all that they do. If you and I don't keep close to Jesus, this is how we're going to end up. Parched, dry, not fruitful, not overly effective. We're just going to end up like this. If we don't keep close to Jesus, we need that regular moisture. We need that regular feeding. We need that regular time with the Lord. If you and I are going to be those that serve others, put others first in our life, we must keep close to Jesus to be fruitful. If we don't keep close to Jesus and we keep giving out, we're going to end up like this. We're going to end up spending all of our life and actually losing the most important thing of all, a sweet walk with Jesus, a close walk with Jesus. And we're going to end up like this. So apologies, whoever did the flowers today, for my attempt. It's probably about the best I could ever do at flower arranging that. And here we are on Pentecost morning. Here we are on a day that we remind ourselves where God by His power and might on a day in history fulfilled a prophetic word that was given by Joel in chapter 2 that one day all men would see and know and feel the presence of Almighty God by the power of person of the Holy Spirit of God. In times past, His Spirit came upon certain individuals at various times and in different places to anoint them and empower them to fulfill ministry and purpose in the Old Testament era. But Joel foretold, Joel prophesied of a day where the Spirit of the living God would fall upon all flesh. The young would receive Him. The old would receive Him. Men would receive Him. Women would receive Him. The Spirit of the living God would fall upon His people. And we live in that era. We live in that age. 
And I just sense this morning there are some of us that need a fresh touch of the Spirit of the living God. A few weeks ago, we talked about the importance of being full of the Holy Spirit. Ephesians 5.18 Do not be drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, let the Holy Spirit fill and control you. You, I, need to keep close to Jesus and we need to come to this well, if I could put it like this. We need to come to this place. We need to come to our majestic and mighty and glorious and gracious God and we need to cry out to Him this morning and say, Lord, by Your Spirit, fill me anew. I want to be full of Your Holy Spirit. I don't want to end up looking like that little tree. I need to be replenished. And some of you might feel a little bit like you're running on empty this morning. And I'm going to call you this morning, in a few minutes, to do something perhaps that you've never done before, some of you. And that's be willing to receive prayer. That the Spirit of God would fill you in there. So at the end this morning, with no drama whatsoever, if you want to receive prayer for that, you just sense you're, you're dry. And you need a fresh touch of God, a fresh touch of His Holy Spirit. It's no better day than the day of Pentecost to think about such things. Uh, just at the end, just come forward and sit up here in the corners and, and we'll come and we'll pray with you. That you might receive afresh from the Holy Spirit of God. And at the moment you're running on, on little or nothing you feel, but God's saying to you this morning, I want you to be refilled. I want you to know something of a fresh touch of the Spirit of God. Not to be afraid about that and be open to that. We need to find a place to meet with God. And I've said what I'm going to say really now. But as we come to an end, I want us to watch a, a video clip of a pastor from the United States of America. His name is Bill Hybels, he's senior pastor of Willow Creek. And he's just going to chat to you about finding a place to meet with God. This is what it's all about. You've got to find a place to meet with God each day. Because if we're going to know His presence in our life, and if we're going to know what it is intentionally to be useful to others, and be those who take responsibility for our own spiritual lives, we need to make sure that our own life is ship-shaped spiritually as well. We need to keep close to Jesus. So we're going to watch it. It's nine minutes long. I want to ask you now to be open to what he's going to say because it's going to be challenging. I'm just going to pray before we, we watch together. God, by your Holy Spirit this morning, speak into our lives. May the words that we now listen to touch our lives, Lord. Lord, we're, we're open to what you're going to say to us. And I pray that our Lord will be open to not only hearing and being challenged, but Lord, to change, if necessary, what we do with our lives and to find a place where we meet with you. Amen. Let's watch it together. advertising executive came down to talk to me after a, a service and he had just become a Christian. I had, I had baptized him at the church and so, and uh, he said, I, I just can't make time for a meeting with God. He said, you have no idea what it's like to commute downtown every day and you live in a different world. I, I can't, I just can't fit it, fit that kind of thing into my life. 
And I remember looking at this young guy, hard-charging young guy, and, and I said, here's my experience, and I'm not, you know, I'm only like 24 years old, so there it is. I said, I've always been able to make time for stuff I value. Just how my life works. If I value something, I'll make time to experience it. If I don't, I won't. And I'm making time for a meeting with God in my life. You do it any way you want. And uh, he wasn't too happy with me that day, I don't think. And I didn't see him for a while. And then afterwards, I saw him many months later. And when he came down to talk to me, he, his countenance was different. He felt different. His conversation was different. And he invited Lynn and me. He and his wife invited Lynn and me to go over to their house for dinner. So we accepted. He lived right in the area. And so we go over to their house. And uh, as we're kind of just having some appetizers beforehand, he takes me over to a rocking chair. And he says, you know how you challenged me to have a meeting with God and to just to make the time. He said, I, I've, I love rocking chairs, so I bought a good one. And you said that maybe if you're going to make this repeatable and enjoyable, you should look at some scene or vista that you enjoy looking at. And he said, I've got a little backyard here, and I love looking over the backyard. So he said, I, I just bought this chair, and I put it in, at my favorite window where I can overlook the backyard. And he said, I got up a half hour earlier, 15, 20 minutes, half hour earlier each day the last several months. I sit in the chair. I have a cup of coffee. And he goes... I read God's word, I try to make sense of it, I ask him to speak to me by his word, then I meditate on it, reflect it, apply it to my life, then he said I write some thoughts down in a journal and I pray, I pray that I will be more aware of his presence in my life. And I said, how's, how's that going for you? And his wife jumped in and said, I'll tell you how it's going for him, he's a changed guy. What happens to him? when he sits in that chair, has changed him. He's more centered. He's a more gentle and loving man in our marriage and to our children. I was very impressed with this, that he could show me his chair, that he had taken the time, that he had fashioned a meeting with God that he looked forward to, because he liked the chair, he liked the view, he liked the coffee, he was a morning guy, and he fell into this pattern. Many months later, uh, I had coffee with him one time, and he said, I'm thinking about leaving my job in advertising. He said, it just, it, um, I think I'm done with that. I said, where'd you get these ideas? And he said, well, in my meetings with God in the chair. That's, he's been putting those thoughts in my mind. I said, what are you going to do? And he said, well, maybe I'll just help you build the church. I said, well, no one's getting paid around here, you know. And he said, well, I've done pretty well in advertising. I can hold on for a while, and, and uh, maybe if the church grows, you know, then maybe they can help me and my family in some way. And I said, well, you better go back to that chair and see if God's really in this, because I don't want to take responsibility for your life and all this. And he said, okay, I will, and came back about a month later, and he said, you know, I, I gave notice at, at work, and if it's all the same to you, I'm just going to help you start building the church. You pay me what you can, but it's not a concern of mine. And this guy joined our staff, and I'm telling you, he was a hardworking, energized, joyful, uh, industrious individual that really, really helped our church and was on our staff for many, many years. One of the best staff members in the early days of the church. Then one day he comes into my office and he said, you know, I, I still do that meeting with God in that chair, that rocking chair. And he said, God's been stirring in my life in my meetings with God. And he said, uh, a friend of mine starting a brand new church in Colorado and I think I'm going to pack my family up and move to Colorado. I said, can they support you? He said, no, I'm going to have to go back into the marketplace and uh, make some money because they, they can't afford anything. And uh, I said, you, are you ready to do that? And he said, you know, every morning I talk to God about it. And he said, I'm really fired up about it. So we said goodbye to him, and he packed his family up, and he went out and he went back into advertising, made a lot of money, and gave most of it to the startup church. And it became a fantastic church. And then in that same chair that he moved out to Colorado, sitting at a window in the morning like he had done for many, many years now, he processed a bad medical report he got from the doctor that cancer had come his way. 
And he kept working and he kept supporting that church. And uh, he got sicker and sicker. It was a very fast spreading kind of cancer. And uh, then he was hospitalized. And one of the great losses he felt when he was in the hospital is that he didn't have his chair. And he died quite soon thereafter, and I did his funeral in Colorado. And I was talking to his widow, his wife, uh, at the funeral reception afterwards. I said, that was something about that chair, wasn't it? She said, his whole life changed in that chair. I said, what are you going to do with the chair? And she said, we are going to pass that chair on to our children and on to our grandchildren in the hopes that someone would sit in it like Tom did and have their life transformed. Simple question, gang. Where's your chair? Where do you meet with God? Where do you reflect on his word and open yourself to his power? Where, where do you become aware of his presence in your life? Where is that? And some of you go, well, you know, I mean, I don't have a nice backyard to look out on. It doesn't work for me. It, the thing about the unlimited presence of God is that you can meet with him anywhere. Your chair can be anywhere. When we first started, Lynn and I first started taking our summer study breaks in South Haven, that little town on the other side, uh, we rented a one-bedroom cottage in the summer times, and so it was chaos with two kids in, in that cottage. So I would leave, and I would go to the Burger King in the morning for 30, 40, 45 minutes, sometimes an hour. First booth on the right when you come in the door, Main Street in South Haven. I did that little practice for nine years. Fiberglass booth in a Burger King. I made some of the most important ministry and personal decisions in my life. Fiberglass booth in a Burger King. To this day when I drive by that Burger King, I look at it and I go, man, God met me there. There's a carpenter in this church that meets with God every morning in the front seat of his pickup truck, brings a thermos of coffee and his Bible. Half hour before the construction starts, he just sits in the front seat of his pickup truck, absorbs the word of God, meets with God, surrenders himself with God, to God, asks for direction in his life. A young mom that I know goes to Starbucks whenever she can. Corner table, meets with God. Where's your chair? When you meet with a friend, let's say for a lunch, what happens is, if you've connected with that friend, after you leave the restaurant or wherever it is, you think about that friend later on in the afternoon. When you meet with God, you think about him more throughout the course of your day. His presence lingers after the meeting. Where's your chair? Galatians 2.20, Paul said, I've been crucified with Christ and I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body, I live by the faith, by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Where's the place where you meet with God? You can meet with him this morning. You're going to find that place. You're going to seek his presence. Seek his favor. Seek his love. Heavenly Father, we come to you this morning. And we can do so much in your name but Lord Jesus if our relationship with you is just cold and at arm's length we're just going to end up like that that plant this morning all withered 
and unfruitful. And Lord, I sense it by spirit this morning. There are many that can just see that visual illustration and they know it's their life spiritually. It didn't need me to identify it, but yet, Lord, it's helped them, Lord, to identify it. And I pray that today, if this is, this is me, this is, this, this is any of us, Lord, this morning, that we'd be, be willing, Lord, first to say, Lord Jesus, we're sorry for not finding that chair, that place, that spot, where we can not only talk with you, but listen to you. And Lord, I, I ask that, Lord, on this day of Pentecost, that your Holy Spirit would re refresh us, Lord. I just sense that's a word for someone this morning. They, they need refreshing. Things have got stale. And it's because of the relationship with you just isn't what it used to be. So, Lord, refresh, Lord, our soul this morning. May we indeed be like trees planted along the river bank that find moisture and replenishment and all that's necessary to bear fruit in our season. Help us, I pray. In the name of Jesus, amen. We have one song to finish our morning of worship. Let me just say, once again, if there are those of you this morning who would like to receive prayer then after we've sung just come and just come and sit out the front here maybe quite symbolic to you to come and sit by a tree that looks practically barren and and on its way out and you just say uh, that's me but i don't want to be like that <laughs> i want to be revived i want to be refreshed so you just come for prayer if that's you this morning thanks music team let's stay